The next speaker I'm going to introduce to you is Elsa Miedema. And she is a Dutch political historian. And um, she recently uh, did research on the rise of, uh, of, and of the animal politics uh, movement. And although she told me <laughs> while we were preparing this, I'm not going to be able to tell them everything. I hope she's going to tell us a lot about what she found. So a warm welcome, please, to Elsa Miedema. Well, thank you, Elsa. And uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining. Um, so I think I've got the heaviest task today to uh, speak just after Esta Auhan. So uh, I don't feel pressure at all. <laughs> um, so, uh, but I have some interesting stuff to share with you. So I'm also very excited. Um, first, I want to say that you can ask questions everywhere where you're from where you're ask, uh, from where you're looking at this. So. Um, uh, don't hesitate, ask, ask all your questions. Hopefully I'll have some minutes left after my talk to, uh, uh, to answer all your questions. Um, so, uh, today and tomorrow is all about food and health. But um, before we dive into uh, more interesting lectures about food and health, I will tell you a bit more about the rise of the global animal politics movement. Um, I think, uh, so Elsa already told, me, uh, told you, uh, I uh, did some research on that. So I will uh, tell you some of my uh, conclusions. And I think many people who are watching, especially on Facebook or uh, on YouTube, not all of them are really like insiders to the movement. So um, some people might think, well, this is a very uh, small movement still. Um, but let me start by uh, drawing the animal politics landscape for you. So the, uh, currently there are um, animal advocacy parties in 21 countries all over the world. Um, not only in like quote unquote Western countries, but uh, well, most of them are like in Western countries, but uh, all over the world, these parties are uh, occurring and uh, um, getting established. And um, Esther already told you that there are 158 elected representatives uh, in uh, seven countries. So those countries are uh, the Netherlands, France, the UK, Portugal, Italy, uh, Germany, and Australia. Um, and um, the, the, the movement is growing every year. So um, at this moment, a handful of parties is in the making. So. Um, uh, like parties like in uh, countries like Peru, Chile, Japan and Zimbabwe, people are uh, working very hard to uh, establish a new party, which is very well, cool, I think. Um, so, and the Animal Politics Foundation, uh, um, it was founded in 2012 by the uh, Dutch Party for the Animals. Um, this organization really like works as a connector um, to all the parties. So they um, they connect all the parties to share knowledge, to sh share experience. Um, so in order to strengthen the movement actually, and uh, well, also in uh, uh, on conferences like these, of course. So I don't think we can call this a sm small movement anymore, right? Um, so my question was, what can explain the rise of the animal uh, of uh, political animal advocacy parties in the in the last few decades all over the world. Um, so, and it was also the main question uh, for my research, and uh, it's quite of a broad question. So many answers uh, are possible to this question, and I looked into into some uh, possible answers, uh, some of which I will share with you. So a little side note I want to make with this question is that uh, I, so I looked into the uh, the rise of these these parties, but I don't mean necessarily like the electoral success. Um, I rather mean or I rather looked at the uh, really establishment of the parties. So uh, I think another idea that people might have is that this is, this is uh, well next. Uh, um, 
it's 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 a small movement people think right and i think people also think that it's a very young movement especially right uh, maybe uh, from the last decade or maybe two decades but that's not entirely true as well um so it is yes it's a relatively new movement but the first party that was established was in germany and there was the partei mensch umwelt tierschutz which, which means uh, the party for people, environment, and animal rights. And that was back in 1993. So it was almost three decades ago. So, and it was quite revolutionary that they uh, established this party because with establishing this party, they also brought, or they introduced the concept of ecocentrism to politics. Well, uh, we've already heard Esther talk about ecocentrism, right? Um, and I think to explain it, this picture says it all, right? Um, so ecocentrism is um, obviously opposite to egocentrism. And uh, where in, whereas in egocentrism, uh, humans put themselves like on top of the pyramid, uh, dominant over other species, uh, ecocentrists um, uh, think that um, humans shouldn't be the dominant species, but all life on Earth is part of the same ecosystem and all life on Earth should work together in order for the system to thrive. And it also works the other way around because um, when all the actors in the system don't work together, uh, eventually the system will collapse. And I think we're all uh, spectators of this collapse, which is happening right now. We see this, of course, well, because of climate change, all these heat waves, these summers, um, uh, well, we all are very, very aware of the um, uh, corona crisis and uh, I think you all notice uh, less and less butterflies and insects every year. So I think we all know that the system is collapsing and um, um, which is very interesting is that the, 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 this concept of ecocentrism became central to all the other animal advocacy parties that were yet to come from 1993 on. And, and which is, uh, um, what is funny as well, or funny if it's interesting as well, is that um, the party names actually uh, reflect this kind of, uh, this, uh, this notion of ecocentrism. Because um, most party names uh, refer to animals. And some people find that very confusing because, um, well, why just only talk about animals, right? So Esther already uh, said something about that. Um, why are you only like policies for animals? Why is that necessary? But actually these names are uh, chosen very thoughtfully and very uh, deliberately actually because um, animals uh, symbolize actually um, this whole notion of ecocentrism because animals are the weakest or the, not the weakest, but the mo most vulnerable beings on earth, right? So, uh, and if they are your starting point, the starting point from which you uh, will form policies, then you can imagine that some different policies will be formed than if you have, uh, if you focus on humans only. So if you want to protect the most vulnerable beings on earth, you want to protect the whole system. And um, that eventually will have a positive impact on people as well, right? Because imagine a world without pandemics. So um, all other parties adhere to this uh, notion of ecocentrism. And they acknowledge that the current, the current crises that we're facing, so uh, all the different cr crises on climate change, what I said before, loss of biodiversity, uh, food, what we're going to talk about later, uh, welfare, uh, or animal welfare, energy, economy, all those crises are interconnected. And they only can be tackled in connection with each other. So, but back to my question, uh, why does the animal politics movement keep expanding? Um, so that has something to do uh, with what which I call political opportunity. So um, I know that um, the, this concept of political opportunity is used in various ways by various uh, academics, but this is my definition of uh, political opportunity. Uh, it's the space within a country's political arena that is left to be occupied by new political ideas and values. 
So, uh, and it's also uh, very much influenced, of course, by like uh, uh, general morality of the time, well, um, or uh, by what other parties say or the stance uh, of other parties in um, uh, different subjects. Um, but I think people become more and more aware of all the crises we're facing. So, um, what I said, climate change, COVID, uh, loss of biodiversity, all those things. Um, and I think, um, especially with COVID, uh, well, many other infection diseases will, uh, uh, will arise if we like keep treating the animals uh, uh, the way we treat them now, right? Uh, like Esther said before as well. So um, I think these modern day threats and especially the lack of political willpower and the lack of political knowledge as well, I think, um, that results in, in an expansion of this political opportunity for new parties to arise. So for uh, uh, animal advocacy parties to arise and to uh, address this crisis and to uh, uh, provide sustainable uh, solutions as well. Um, right, so another thing that might explain the rise of the, uh, of the movement is uh, that animal advocacy parties um, have a very different way in which they conduct politics, right? They use the political tools in a very different way. And I think that's because they aren't really politicians at heart, but they're more like activists in politics. So uh, they see themselves more like a catalyst. So they want to address subjects and they want to put uh, uh, subjects on the political uh, agenda that weren't on there before. And um, uh, well, a funny thing to say, this is that the, the Party for the Animals calls itself also like the pacer in a marathon. And uh, they mean by that is that uh, the, they set the pace for other parties to, to run. So if you uh, are running faster than other parties, the other parties eventually have to run, run along with you, right? So, um, well, these parties also, they just don't play along with the political games. They're just not very interested in the political games. So, and one thing that's connected with that is that they uh, reject the left-right spectrum. Because we, so we have actually... I think all the parties like adhere to this left-right spectrum, so they call themselves left-wing or centrist or right-wing. But most party have pretty, uh, most animal advocacy parties don't call themselves that. So they like to place themselves on the edge of the political arena, so to say. And um, so they really want to provide solution-based politics. So that's a completely different way of using the political tools. And it also uh, leads to sometimes other parties, other party members um, looking at you like a little bit, like maybe a bit scared or maybe a bit like they want to laugh uh, 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 about you. But eventually, I think it works. So um, to conclude, uh, like I said, I think the political opportunity is a very important explanation to the question why this, uh, why these um, uh, animal advocacy parties were established in the last three decades, and um, there becomes there comes more room on the in the political arena for parties to address these modern day issues in a sustainable way. And by op occupying this space, um, these um, parties also gave rise to uh, to a unique political approach, which was based on ecocentrism. So. I'd like to conclude with a positive note as well, because we're going to hear some less positive conclusions as well today and tomorrow. So uh, let's uh, keep it a, a little, a bit light. Yes. <laughs> so I think that, or what I've seen in my research is that the political uh, opportunity window will expand more and more because people will become more aware of everything that's happening and the one way to, uh, or the only way to, to address these issues and to come to, come to solutions. And um, this eventually will resu re result in the expansion of the global animal politics movement as well. So I think that's a very optimistic uh, perspective for the planet and all its inhabitants. Thank you. <laughs> it's 
so nice to see you applauding. It helps. <laughs> it's really <laughs> good. Yeah. Thank you very much, Elsa. Yes. We have time for uh, a small round of uh, questions. Right. And uh, I'm starting. Where do I go? A question from Sweden. What would we take from your research to attract attention, to gain support and to be able to grow and eventually win seats? Um, right, so there are a few things actually. Um, so, yes, I looked at several things in my research. Mm -hmm. So um, this political opportunity is one part of it. And I think it's, it's, um, it's a good thing to like, um, research this political opportunity in your country, what other parties are there that address these issues and in what way are they doing this? Mm -hmm. And um, so to look for space actually to position yeah. yourself in this, on this, on the field uh, of especially like the, the, the environment, uh, environmental issues. Um, so that's one way I think. Um, but the other way is, um, so I didn't really look into winning seats and electoral success and how to get there. But I learned that some parties, well, not all parties uh, for the animals have seats. So, but uh, I've learned that a lot of parties that don't have chosen uh, uh, representatives mm -hmm. are very successful mm. because they can uh, work together uh, on a local uh, basis with uh, smaller organizations, with NGOs, with maybe other uh, um, political parties that have representatives that can, they have more influence. So it's not only necessary to look at the seats to win, it's more necessary to look at, well, how can I make impact yes. in, in our situation? Hmm. And maybe adding to this, this maybe you can uh, go into the differences between green parties and animal advocacy parties. Because uh, people often say, well, the greens are doing so well in our country. So what do we have to add? What, what's the, uh, what is our unique proposition? Yeah, yes. yeah. I think this is also something that people that are not really like insiders to the movement think about uh, with, when they see like green parties and animal advocacy parties that they're quite the same. Mm -hmm. But I think there are a lot of differences. Mm. And um, I think the most di uh, important differences, difference, difference is that, um, well, this uh, starting point um, of animals. Mm -hmm. So when you start with animals, like I said, um, you will form completely different policies. Uh, green parties actually... I think all of them always uh, still start with the with the, with humans on top of the pyramid, and eventually, so they're yeah, more like this and less yeah. like this in yeah. your uh, view. Yeah, yes, right. Yes, I think mm -hmm. so. Um, and eventually, I think another important thing is that you hold a, have to hold on to your values, and um, I think that's something that green parties don't always do as well, especially mm -hmm. if they have the are in a position to like become uh, um, in a more come in a more powerful uh, mm -hmm. uh, position mm -hmm. then eventually they will play along with the political game mm -hmm. and um, animal advocacy parties don't do that yeah that's <laughs> very clear <laughs> thank you <laughs> I'm scrolling on uh, a question from Poland we need to change the policy and the system from the inside out we need allies in government what first step should we take to build a political movement I think Esther talked about that a bit, but maybe yeah. you can add to that. Yeah, uh, w what I can add is uh, one uh, one of the um, um, parties that I uh, examined in my in my research was the um, the Danish party, so mm -hmm. the the vegan party. Yes, they call mm -hmm. vegan party. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. and I think that's a very interesting party because mm -hmm. it's a very young party. It's I think last year they were officially recognized in their country as a political party, and they don't have any seats yet. Um, mm -hmm. So, but what they did is that they were just um, they just called like everyone they 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 thought of uh well maybe i can uh they can they want to work together with us or um we can have something uh in common or and they also they just called and emailed a lot of mps and some of them uh, actually want to work together and um they uh, just yeah 
I think uh, another thing that works very well is that you just uh, organize a lot of like very visible events mm. um, so that the press has to like come there and see you and yeah. notice you. Mm -hmm. um, so that they did that as well very uh, successfully. So uh, I think that's very interesting case study to to look at if you uh, if you're looking to uh, yeah yeah to build your your party. Thank you, thank you. Uh, we have a few more minutes. Uh, and, uh, and then we go to a break. Um, I have a question here uh, through YouTube. We are still with not enough animal rights activists or organizations for the animals. So how do we make a big lobby to change our food system into a vegan plant-based one? Maybe that's a question that we can answer tomorrow at the end that of the so conference, too, right? Yeah. Because then we, we will have heard uh, from various speakers, how to use yeah. your influence and how to add to, to add to the movement. I'm not because an ex expert on lobby organizations, so... <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. So if you don't mind, we'll keep that for tomorrow. Um, then uh, I think the last question for this round will be from Lebanon. What if, the, if they leave you no space at all? In Lebanon, the democrat, uh, democratic uh, country is becoming a hub of religions and sects and dictators who uh, inherit their children and, and grandchildren uh, in the parliament uh, seats. So, yeah. yeah, what do you do when the, when the uh, democracy is declining, which is yeah. obviously happening in Lebanon? Yeah. What would you advise people to do? Well, that seems very difficult to me. So... Um it's great news that they they want to try i think mm -hmm. um but They're very active yeah that's great we met <laughs> yes we did um so but i think uh, the most important tool you have is social media and the people mm -hmm. like when you don't have politics on your side you have the people and um like i think esther said this as well that um most people want this change yes. and they want yeah, to the heart. Yes, yes and they want to to uh, respect animals more and um, so I think uh, social media is very powerful to, to tool to use mm. in this way so just yeah get your uh, get people to to join your activism and then you will eventually grow like a very big group that well they can deny anymore yes yes. And of course, there are always powers that are, well, you, you can't control, but yes. to also to keep your spirit high, it, it's very important to find each other and to work together. Yes, and, uh, yes. Yeah, keep up uh, the good work. Yes, and yeah. also to have this like this pr powerful movement and feeling that you're working mm -hmm. together on this yeah. thing. Yes. Yeah. That's so then it's about good. influence, how you can influence yeah. either the people who are in power or the people in the street, as, as, yes, I as think so, so to speak. Yeah. 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 Okay. Well, Elsa, thank you very much. Yes. Uh, this was the last question for this moment. Okay. So well. Thank you very, very much for You're your good. talk.